it's really a pleasure and a privilege for me to introduce Nate Persley, whom I've known for 30 years, and we've been friends for a long, long time. And I'm going to give you a very brief introduction because his career is varied and very distinguished, but we don't have, I don't want to steal a lot of his time. So here goes. So Nate Persley is the James B. McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford Law School, and he's the director of the Stanford Cyber Policy Center. His work has revolved around the law of democracy, which is the title of his leading co-authored case book on the subject, now in its fifth edition. And that book, the, the law of democracy, covers voting rights, redistricting, campaign finance, and the regulation of political parties. In addition to extensive writings on these projects. Nate is a practitioner as well, having served as the Senior Research Director of the Presidential Commission on Election Administration and on numerous occasions as a court-appointed special master to craft redistricting plans for Congress and state legislatures. And he must have not anger too many people because he did this in Georgia, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. And, uh, he, you know, they kept asking him to come back. His most recent work as director of the Cyber Policy Center has focused on the way new communication technologies affect democracy. And he's co-editor with Josh Tucker sitting there. Uh, of the Cambridge Press book, Social Media and Democracy. And his teaching includes courses on free speech, democracy, and the internet. And he's a practitioner in this field as well, having written the initial draft of the Platform Accountability and Transparency Act, a bipartisan bill introduced last month in the Senate. And this bill would require large social media companies to share data with outside researchers. So more work for you, Josh. Um, and however, I'll have to say this, his greatest claim to fame is that he received his PhD in political science at UC Berkeley. Some of his teachers are in this room, which he frequently says, and this he's saying this himself, was the most enriching academic environment he has experienced, which is saying a lot since he's been a professor at Penn in Columbia, as well as a visiting professor at many of the nation's top law schools. So thank you for remembering us, and thank you so much for coming and delivering this talk. Thank you. Well, well thank you so much. Um, Jack was on my dissertation committee uh, and we shared, you know, many a drink in the faculty club, as with as most graduate students here can attest to, uh, during their time, and so I have very fond memories of this department. And and it's true that uh, that it really was of all the places that I've uh, been, uh, this was the most inter uh, enriching intellectual environment that I've experienced. Um, I'll say that uh, you know, the burning question is why am I wearing a tie, uh, and and. The answer was, I figured as a Stanford professor coming up to Berkeley, I had to wear the Berkeley colors. So either either I was going to wear this tie or I was going to have to find a yellow sport coat. And I thought, you know, uh, that 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 uh, that was unlikely. Um, now, now there's a, there's a challenge with uh, being the lunchtime keynote here, which is that there's a risk uh, that you could be preempted. And that that did happen. Uh, today, so a lot of what I was going to say was was said before uh, in the in the original panel. So I thought, as with Josh, I'll, I'll just change the topic. <laughs> thought I should talk to you about why we should ban gas stoves. Uh, I, I thought that maybe that would be spend the next half hour uh, talking about that. Um, uh, no, I, I mean a lot of it was actually I, you, the last panel teed up what I'm going to talk about. Uh, even the questions from the audience were sort of focused on this. The, the title of this talk is uh, A Strategic Retreat in the War on Disinformation, which is like a politically carefully way of describing what, what the argument that I'm going to make. Um, I was going to say, let's give up on the war on disinformation. Let's, you know, uh, uh, start rethinking this. But I'm going to sort of make an argument that flows from some of the questions that you all were asking to the last panel about how we should refocus our efforts in thinking about the disinformation problem. But in order not to repeat what just happened in the previous session, 
I thought I would, uh, you know, put my lawyer's hat on and, and policy hat on and talk a little bit about the policies dealing with disinformation uh, and also some of the cases that are working their way up to the Supreme Court that are going to deal with uh, these issues of intermediary liability and, and uh, also what's happening in Europe. Um, and, and, and let me just talk a little bit, uh, start by saying like who the audience is for this talk. Well, well, it's you, of course, uh, and, and the tens of millions who are joining us online right now. Um, uh, but, but it's uh, also, I just spent the last week in Paris, I know hazard, you know, pay for us uh, academics, uh, talking to European regulators, uh, because the most significant, um, th there, there are two huge changes that may come in the next year when it comes to policies towards speech online. The first is the Digital Services Act uh, coming out of uh, the EU, which has been passed and now is going to be implemented. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. And the second is a set of cases working their way through the Supreme Court, up to the Supreme Court, dealing with you know, you've probably heard of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, as well as these laws that are, are happening in Florida and in Texas. So I'm going to I'm going to wear lots of different hats at, throughout this presentation. I often say, and some of you've heard this before, you can tell when I'm being a political scientist because I have data without opinions. Uh, you can tell when I'm being a law professor because I have opinions without data. Uh, and then you can tell when I'm being a lawyer. Well, it depends what my client's telling me to say. So so. Uh, I'll, I'll wear each one of these hats at different stages, and then in the question and answer, you can uh, try and reconcile them. Um, but, but I do, in, in thinking about sort of the audience for this, it is, we're at a critical stage in thinking about policies toward content moderation and disinformation online. And so uh, I'm, I'm sort of directing this out, not just to the people in this room, but also uh, the regulators who are now thinking about these questions. Um, as well as the commentariat in the way that we've been talking about disinformation, because I think we have been talking about it in the wrong way. And I think a lot of that came out in the previous uh, panel, as well as in some of your uh, questions. And so let me just, what I'll do is I'll, I'll give you the basic argument as to why I think we misunderstand the disinformation problem and why we need to refocus our efforts on harm. And then secondly, what are the challenges in policing disinformation, challenges that are mainly faced by the platforms themselves. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about the new technologies that are coming out and why the disinformation problem is actually probably going to get worse. And then finally, I'll, I'll talk more about these policy efforts and these cases that are winding their way through the courts. Now, let me, let's just start with some disinformation basics that have already been covered, which is that, look, we are awash in disinformation. There is a lot of it out there. But as Josh said in, the, in talking about the denominator, right, there's a lot of a lot of things out there uh, online. Um, and so there is a lot of disinformation. I don't want this speech to be misinterpreted as minimizing the problem. Um, but most of the lies that are out there online are harmless. And so you're operating in a, a speech environment in which you have a lot of disinformation out there, but you only really care about some of those lies. And if you're gonna develop a system to deal with disinformation, you have to not just think about um, whether something is true or false, but you have to decide, as Jack was saying, what you really care about. And so no one really wants to subject all for Facebook posts, for example, to a truth test. And what we really care about is about those lies that might cause harm. Uh, as as uh, several of the scholars here, and, and, and Brendan's written about this, and many others who have talked this afternoon, um, for most Americans, disinformation represents a small share of their uh, political news consumption, or just news consumption. In fact, news consumption represents a small share of their media consumption, and even thinking about of the share of the news consumption, how much of it is disinformation, it's a small share, but for some people, like the the group, the the small group that that Josh looked at or or you know there's so many studies on this at this at this point um, that it's a pretty consistent finding with every type of online harm is that there are small communities that consume a lot consume and produce a lot of this problematic content uh, and so we sometimes talk about these people as say disinformation super spreaders same could be say about could said about hate speech these kinds of things um, and so the 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 normative argument I want to make from the beginning, is that, look, we cannot develop a lie detector for the internet. And even if we could, it would actually not solve the disinformation problem. That I think will be a little bit more provocative, and, but I hope to convince you that. And the third thing 
is that we really need to refocus our efforts on harm and not try to police the distinction between what is true and what is false. And that is not an easy task in and of itself, right? I mean, policing harm is, is, is not going to uh, make this an easier problem for us, but that is what that is the business that internet platforms are in already. And it's something that where we really need to focus. So let me start with just some concession sort of um, what we'll call you know, pre-buttles here uh, to what I think would be uh, obvious objections to this argument. Look, I, I don't want, I, I'm not trying to minimize either the harm that disinformation is causing or its pervasiveness. And so whether you're talking about beliefs about COVID or about election denial or about climate change, there are large shares of the American population that believe in false stuff, right? That is conceded. And there's a lot of, as I was saying before, a lot of false communication online. And you know th that, is, that is a problem that we need to deal with. Um, how we deal with that, I think, is, is extremely difficult, as Adam was describing. Um, because you see disinformation causing real harm in the outside world, right? So whether you look at, you know, Pizzagate leaving to someone to shoot up a uh, pizza uh, parlor, Alex Jones, and what happened to uh, the, the Sandy Hook parents, um, but possibly election manipulation, though, as Josh uh, pointed out, maybe not so much in 2016, but you do see this around the world. Um, as well as the fact that, look, we as law professors, lawyers, we deal with the problem of false speech in certain contexts as uh, causing real harm, whether it's fraud or whether it's defamation or whether it's falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater, right? There are instances in which we really care about uh, disinformation. And I think you know, most of what we've talked about here today uh, so far is on what's happening in the United States. Uh, and as bad as the problem may be about just uh, with respect to disinformation in the US, it's probably even worse around the world, especially in places that do not have a kind of pluralized media ecosystem and uh, places like Myanmar where Facebook is the internet and is in many ways like the main source of media for people. And so I, I, again, I don't wanna minimize uh, the, the, how serious a problem this is. And just to, to be a little more prescriptive, and I do think we need to flood the zone with reliable information at every opportunity, whether it's counteracting false beliefs or just as a general rule to try to amplify and highlight uh, reliable sources of information. And as I said before, this move from, from going from truth, policing the line between truth and falsity to, to harm is not you know, it's not going to make our lives easier, but that is actually what the, the business of content moderation at the platforms generally is. Whether you're talking about child exploitation or hate speech or incitement or bullying or threats or blackmail, this is the kind of thing that, that uh, they're in the business of doing. And so if I'm right, or if I can convince you that the most important thing is to deal with the types of speech that are causing harm, really, whether they're true or not, um, that that is sort of a familiar problem, again, with sometimes huge free speech costs, right? If you, if you, if you end up censoring based on harm, but that is, I think, the, the right approach here. Um, one last caveat to, to confront, and that is, hey, the platforms already kind of do this. And to some extent they do. So that disinformation with respect to COVID or disinformation with respect to election denial is treated differently than other kinds of disinformation. All right, and that's partly over time that they realized that they can't police uh, everything. But it is still the case that we have a huge fact-checking industry that is relied on to um, uh, police or to help the platforms police between what is uh, true and what is uh, false. So let me let me start kind of where uh, David Brockman left off in the question. I'm just going to quote all of the questioners uh, as well as the panels. Um, which is, and, and to the needlessly provocative way to say this is that a lot of disinformation is true, okay? I don't really wanna say it that way. A lot of disinformation is not falsifiable, all right? So that most of the kinds of things that we see that are persuading people to have false beliefs are themselves not false statements. And if you are in the business of limiting the question to policing this line between what's true and false, you are going to miss most of the uh, kind of speech that is actually leading people to have false beliefs. Uh, there are many scholars who call this malinformation. You've heard of disinformation, misinformation, malinformation, bad information that then leads to 
um, uh, you know, kinds of sort of false beliefs that might cause harm. Um, I sort of feel like we don't need any more terms. <laughs> we've, we've been, so there's so many people who've talked about the kind of taxonomy of disinformation. Um, and let me just like give you an example of how how this works uh, based off of some of the examples that Adam brought up in the in the first panel. So consider three statements. The first is Obama is not a U.S. citizen. Second, Donald Trump claims Obama is not a U.S. citizen. Third, liberal pundits disagree with Trump claim that Obama is not a U.S. citizen. One of those statements is false. Two of them are true, but they actually have the same effect on the reader. And we can play that game with pretty much any, any kind of statement. And this is not like a law professor's trick. This is the problem. If, if you talk to them, and most of what I'm going to describe here is gained from uh, a lot of the work and discussions I've had with um, people inside the platforms who are doing content moderation and how difficult it is uh, to deal with these things. In, in some ways, the, 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 the really false information, something like, uh, you look, the election is being held on a Wednesday. My personal belief is that it's not really having much of an effect at all. It's the easiest thing to police, right? And you can have automated filters that, that take it off. But uh, it's this malinformation or this slight, this um, biased uh, speech that is really uh, the big problem. Um, so as we think, so what are the tactics that are used in order to um, allow this kind of malinformation to uh, lead people to be persuaded toward false beliefs? So there's exaggeration, taking things out of context, advocacy, sarcasm, satire, and entertainment news coverage of the lies themselves. And then as uh, uh, one previous speakers talked about, just questioning, just raising questions, right? And so let me just, let me just quickly go, go through these. Um, if you look at, at uh, sort of, you know, the field of exaggeration, um, I mean, <laughs> Josh talked about how uh, his, his article is now being exaggerated. People will point to it and they will say, Tucker et al. prove the Russia story was a hoax, right? Um, and it's like, well, what do we do with that, right? And it's like, well, he's he's proving something that that people haven't thought about, or that he's he's got a counterintuitive finding for many people in the uh, commentariat. Is that false, or is it just a kind of exaggeration of his findings? The CDC is not telling you the whole truth about COVID, right? Look at the look at the anti-vax websites. If you're, I, I don't want to even mention them because I don't want to amplify it. But but if 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 you look at the 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 super spreaders of disinformation, most of the anti-vax content on the platform is actually true. Okay. It's just manipulated. There's going to be some bald lies there, you know, if it says ivermectin is going to cure CD, uh, you know, COVID or something like that. But a lot of it uh, is true. Um, and you can go, you know, down the line, pick, pick your issue, climate change, these exaggerations. Second is these decontextualized uh, facts. Um, popular people died the day after they got the vaccine. I actually know someone who had a stroke the day after uh, uh, they got the vaccine. It's like how much you amplify and repeat that, right, is just as uh, uh, effective as if you start making misrepresentations about the vaccine. The number of fraudulent ballots is larger than you ever could have imagined, right? Uh, or uh, uh, as as um, was it was it Adam who had the Charles Grassley quote up there, right? You should not have to meet with the government official before pulling the plug on grandma, right? Um, that's that's a very frequent kind of, uh, uh, you know, style of how disinformation gets out there. Something that is on Snopes right now, one of the major fact-checking uh, services, says Moder Moderna CEO in Davos of all places. So if you want to have that, you know, kind of valence of globalist conspiracy, it's overlaid on there. Um, where they, the, the claim is the CEO of Moderna admitted during a 2023 World Economic Forum meeting that the company was making a COVID-19 vaccination vaccine in January of 2020 before SARS-CoV-2 even had a name. They marked that as false. Why? Because saying that he admitted it make, kind of misrepresents that, that it would, suggests that it was such a controversial thing. That's what they marked as false. It's actually a completely true statement. Um, he did actually admit that it wasn't, it's not a problem though, but it's the way that that story was then shifted in order to sort of decontextualize it and then suggest that there was a conspiracy. Third example is, is just general advocacy, you know, something that we would ordinarily protect as kind of core speech uh, rights, protect yourself, don't get the vaccine, stop for pervasive election fraud, report any illegal voters. You know, it's time to tell the truth about 
you know, Bill Gates, do your, do your, uh, 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 you know, George Soros, go through the, the list of them. One thing that I think is underemphasized is the role that satire, uh, sarcasm, snark, and entertainment play in terms of pervading disinformation, that the line between entertainment and news is increasingly blurred. A lot of people have written about that. Uh, and uh, Kathleen Hall Jameson has a whole project on that. Many of you have read this. But look, for example, at a lot of the content that the Russian trolls that Josh identified, what they put out in 2016. Look at the almost, I think it's roughly 80% of them are non-falsifiable statements. Things like cartoons, where Bernie Sanders is this really sort of, uh, you know, uh, strong figure and has something about him, or, you know, a fight between the devil and God as to who is endorsing, you know, the God, God is preventing Satan from allowing Hillary Clinton to become uh, president, right? It's like, how do you fact check that, right? Uh, and so, so that, that is a, you know, a frequent uh, kind of thing. Look at whether it shows, if you look at some of the Fox News shows that are, that are kind of, bleeding over into entertainment and snark and sarcasm. John Stewart, Dennis Miller, uh, all of these are, are examples. Then there's the news coverage of the lies themselves. And we find that that actually, is, when we talk about lies going mainstream, a lot of it is when the mainstream media then picks it up and then gets uh, amplified. A lot of the story with, with the popularity of QAnon that, that, that has been revealed is that once it was only once it started getting covered in the mainstream press that people started, uh, you know, looking at and understanding uh, that conspiracy theory. Um, as well as, of course, the, you can see the problem that it poses for the platforms if playing a Trump speech, for example, when he says that the election was rigged, that are we going to, are, for them, are they going to uh, essentially excise uh, public state, you know, statements by public figures on issues of, uh, of public concern? And then finally, and there's many more categories, I just wanted to put some of the main ones out there, this idea of just raising questions. It's very familiar to all of us who work in this field, right? Is ch climate change real? What are the CDC and Bill Gates hiding? Was Biden legitimately elected? How many thousands of Republican ballots did Maricopa County fail to count? What's the relationship between Dominion voting systems and Hugo Chavez, right? Uh, you know, you see this all over the place. And so, you know, one of the challenges is that both in the studying of disinformation and the enforcement against disinformation is that we have in our minds this paradigm of a kind of Lincoln-Douglas debate between the, the proponent of the lie and the uh, proponent of uh, facts that would counteract it. And then there's a deliberative process that will occur um, um, to evaluate those claims. But, the, you know, given the types of things that I just put before you, that's not really um, I, I think that the dynamic and we see on online disinformation and you see this in particular with the whole fact checking industry. Now, look, I, th these people are doing yeoman's work. I don't want to suggest that we, you know, we shouldn't uh, encourage this. We need more fact checkers. We need more around the world, which I'll talk about. Um, but it is in some ways an impossible problem uh, for them to solve. And I don't, and, and we all agree that this isn't a problem that can be solved, but it's even an impossible problem for them to uh, address in any meaningful way. Um, and to some extent, I, I do see fact checking has become a kind of disinformation theater of sorts, where the platforms are trying to use this as a way to say, look at everything that we're doing here, um, because they can point to uh, stuff that they send to these fact checkers to try to, to deal with uh, the problem. And so let me let me talk about the problem. So fact checking has a problem uh, from, with respect to scale, cost, speed, durability, and bias. So first on the point about scale, only a few thousand stories every year are going to be professionally fact-checked. Um, the number around the world is gonna be probably under a hundred thousand, depends how you count this stuff, but say the major fact-checking uh, uh, institutions in the US, 10,000 maybe at most, I think it's much less than that. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it, it's even worse outside the United States. Most countries in the world do not have a professional fact-checking architecture. So as we think about like, what should the platforms be doing to deal with disinformation? You've got to use a different mindset than one that is, you know, solely focused on what's happening in the United States. That is why many of them have, have experimented with, you see Twitter using community notes, there was a, a possibility that Facebook would also use the crowd to monitor uh, disinformation. But for reasons that Josh mentioned before, we find that that is like not 
uh, not terribly effective, right? Now, why isn't it terribly effective? And that's because in order to do fact checking when it will matter, it has to be done in an environment of uncertainty, right? Because the the, the news items that go viral, right? Uh, once they go viral, it's too late to do fact checking in any meaningful way to counteract the impact of those stories. So it's not enough that you, even if you dedicated all the resources to having fact checking in that first 24 hours or 48 hours after uh, a news item is out there, it's extremely difficult in that environment to actually to assess whether something is true or not. And as, as Josh was saying, uh, if you do, if we have young, if we have um, uh, users search for evidence, they often find confirming evidence uh, for the false claim. But a lot of the time, it's just like, we don't know whether it's true or false. And so you run into what I'll call the Hunter Biden problem, right? Which is what do you do when you have a crazy theory out there, like Hunter Biden's laptop that might end up being true? Do you de-emphasize de it or demote it as, as the platforms did? Do you remove it? Do you uh, just let the you know marketplace work with that item? Um, no matter what you know, the consequences. Uh, but that is a very familiar problem for the platforms, which is that they are trying to police disinformation at a time when it is most difficult to do so. And so all of these studies that look at earth is flat kind of disinformation seems to me totally beside the point, right? Something that's sort of historic, that, that's happened a long time ago. It's these, the question is what can happen in the wild in a way that will actually go after uh, lies that are occurring in a field of uncertainty. This was the data void point that was also made before. Um, then the last two points on this, which is the durability and bias. So the durability is already, we've already discussed this, which is that even if you can accurately fact check, especially if it's a high salience news item, that it's going to be very difficult for the fact check to win out in the kind of online marketplace uh, and debate. And then finally, we cannot uh, ignore the fact that Republicans actually, I think, rightly believe that the most of the people who are doing fact checking are liberals. And it's a typical kind of criticism that you get um, um, of the media generally. Uh, but if you are going to have a policing of the information environment, um, the fact that you do not have, as a general rule, sort of a real political diversity among the fact checking community is a problem. And that, that, so, so that even if it is the case that, say, there's greater hate speech, greater disinformation, greater pro problematic content coming from one side, um, the fact that the uh, that the that both the effect of these fact checks as well as the personnel who are doing that principally come from one side is is a, a fundamental problem. And so there are real costs uh, to policing disinformation in this way. There's the actual cost, uh, as I was saying before, about paying for the fact checks and all of that. Uh, and the allegations to the platforms that they're engaging in systematic bias, you can see this most recently with the, the Twitter files that, that and, and the way that Elon Musk is framing the Twitter files actually in the way, in the way that they're released. Um, there's also the risk as, as was true with the Hunter Biden laptop story or with um, you know, certain uh, uh, stories around COVID that something that is seen as disinformation and police as disinformation at time one turns out to be true or at least not falsifiable at time two. Uh, and and though that totally wrecks the credibility for a lot of what the, um, the companies are doing. Um, and the final point, uh, which I actually I don't think was made in, in the last panel, but I know uh, that they, they, those folks have, have done some foundational research on this, that the more that we are policing the line between true and false and trying to highlight how much disinformation and maybe even exaggerate how much disinformation is out there, that people are going to become more suspicious of the truth. And that um, I think most of what we've learned over the last decade is that um, people are getting better actually at trying to discern false stories, but they're becoming worse at discerning what is true or not. And that is a cost to democracy as well. Uh, and so the, the moral panic around disinformation, as much as I said, it is a real problem and it is a real problem around the world um, that the, you got to make sure that the cure is not worse than the disease. But I also, I want to reemphasize, this is not saying that disinformation is not a problem. It's that we need to start focusing on the uh, on the harm that disinformation causes, whether it's, for example, people, or whether not just the harm that disinformation causes, the harm that certain types of speech categories cause, whether it's election manipulation, 
COVID uh, disinformation, COVID information or slanted information or any number of other things. Now, let me tell you why I think this problem is going to get worse as well as the, uh, the, 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 the enforcement is going to get even more difficult. I'll just talk about this from the standpoint of the new technologies uh, that, are, that are underway. And then I'll talk a little bit about policy. The first is uh, the rise of virtual and augmented reality. I'm at least someone who doesn't think the metaverse is like gonna descend and we're all gonna be using it within the next few years. But, but suppose you're one of those people. Um, uh, what does it mean to police disinformation in an artificial environment? I mean, the whole environment is actually a lie after all. Uh, and so what it means is virtual reality, right? Where you're policing what is truth. There's, there's a kind of fundamental disconnect there as well as the challenges where a lot, a lot of what's happening is gonna in the metaverse is gonna be evanescent and um, uh, you know, it's gonna be happening in real time. And they're talking about how do you do real time content moderation uh, in the metaverse? So I think virtual and augmented reality poses a kind of fundamental concern from a disinformation perspective. The second is the rise of uh, blockchain technologies. So um, it's always a kind of a problem when a Stanford professor is now talking about blockchain technology because uh, 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 one of the uh, chief chief uh, targets of the scandal is now under house arrest 100 yards from my office at Stanford. So, um, uh, and I don't wanna, I also don't wanna, as with the metaverse, I don't wanna overstate, you know, the significance of blockchain as, as providing some kind of foundational change to the internet. But blockchain is, is, is one of several different types of decentralized uh, technologies and the policing of disinformation in a more decentralized, say, social media ecosystem becomes increasingly difficult. If you think it's a problem for the platforms to police disinformation and content when they're actually in a position of authority, imagine when you have it uh, distributed among a, a, a network which is deliberately designed to remove the power of a central moderator. The third, is what's often called generative AI, but I call uh, automated creativity, which is the, the use of things like ChatGPT and Dolly and MidJourney and these other kinds of technologies. So um, I, I don't know about you, but I mean, I, although I'd seen a lot of stuff with these large language models, the, the, when ChatGPT came out, you know, and was become popularized two months ago, it was for me a kind of aha moment about the future of technology. And, and like, you know, you talk to techies, they're like, oh, yeah, we've known this all the time. But, but I think you can start to see the, the sheer um, expansive uh, effect of, of this new technology. One area is in the area of disinformation. And we have a report out from the Stanford Internet Observatory last week. Um, you know, disinformation, creating false websites, creating false text is cheap. Now, all it takes is you to type it in, but it takes you that, right? It takes at least the, some effort of a human being to generate some of these false stories. Once you have AI generating them, then um, there's there's a real challenge, I think, to sort of maintaining the integrity of the uh, information ecosystem. And so, um, uh, you know, th there are a lot of people who try to think about ways to to combat this, to try to, to uh, put the genie back in the bottle or to try to uh, uh, change the kind of information that is out there to, that, to fool these kind of tools. But it's an incredibly adversarial environment where I think um, generative AI is, is going to end up, you know, sort of winning the day. La so since uh, I've got a little over time, I want to let me talk about the policy issues uh, uh, and, and what's happening in, in court. Um, well, first, let, let me let me just talk about the DSA. I want everyone to kind of like pay attention to what's happening in Europe because it is so important for the future of the internet. Um, um, the 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 and the you know the way that the Europeans have done this, you know, is is that the DSA, the Digital Services Act, and the Digital Markets Act, which is passed alongside it, um, they they are you know regulate. They, they've done some very important things, and uh, these are these are very big laws. But let me just highlight a few things. They're forcing the companies to do systemic risk analysis to look at how their products might be causing risks across a number of dimensions, right? And a lot of it is going to be relevant uh, to disinformation. The companies then have to come up with a plan for addressing those systemic risks, and they'll be held accountable uh, to them. These they distinguish between what are called VLOPs very large online platforms. Uh, you can, you know, use that at your next cocktail party. Uh, uh, but, and then, and then the, the smaller companies, but how the firms react to the DSA requirements on systemic risk is going to be extremely important, not just to the regulation of speech in Europe, 
but actually around the world, because part of what we've learned from European privacy laws is that um, that the platforms just say, screw it, we'll just apply it around the world. So the GDPR, which is sort of the prominent uh, European privacy law, has had that uh, effect. So that's what's happening in Europe, I think, it's, and I'm happy to answer questions since I was uh, sitting with the regulators last week in, uh, in Europe and talking about it. Second thing I want to talk about is what's happening in the U.S. and that we have what those of us who work in the free speech and 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 uh, internet regulation area, you're you're having what uh, what would have been 15 years of case law that happened in Europe, being jammed into six months in the United States. Okay, on fundamental questions about the uh, rights and responsibilities of these internet companies. Um, Everyone, or many of you have heard of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, right? This is the, the provision that basically immunizes platforms for user-generated content on the platform. So Facebook is not, if you go out on Facebook and you defame me, face, uh, you know, <laughs> don't try this at home. Uh, 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 the, the, um, they are not live. I can't sue Facebook for the defamation. But there's this case called Gonzalez versus Google briefs are due, actually were due last week and oral arguments a month or so, um, the, which says th th that there was a terrorist attack in Paris. Um, some kids were killed. The parents are suing YouTube and Google uh, and Twitter and, and Facebook, but but the Gonzalez versus Google is about, about YouTube, um, which, and saying that these terrorists were radicalized on YouTube. And so therefore the, um, the, the, YouTube is liable for damages uh, caused by uh, the terrorist killings. Uh, this is kind of a frontal assault on Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Um, and if it goes through, then you would expect the platforms to engage in a lot more censorship. What's interesting, this is, this is true both in, in Congress and at the Supreme Court, um, is that, well, particularly in Congress, right, the Democrats and Republicans both hate, hate big tech um, but they hate it for different reasons. Um, and at the Supreme Court, you don't have the familiar alliances that we've seen on First Amendment law, where actually the conservatives in recent years have been, you know, most out on a limb protecting free speech rights, um, particularly of corporations, that actually Clarence Thomas has written some stuff, as well as, you know, some of the other more conservative members of the court starting to think about these internet platforms as like common carriers. And so that they wouldn't have maybe the same free speech rights as other corporations or as you and me. At the same time that that case is going through the courts, you've got the net choice cases coming out of Texas and Florida. So Texas and Florida, and, and these are absolutely diametrically opposed kinds of cases. In Texas and Florida, they have passed laws that, um, that basically say the platforms are not allowed to remove certain uh, certain posts based on, say, viewpoint. This will have the effect of, of neutering their ability to take down hate speech. It will also have the effect of neutering their ability to take down certain kinds of disinformation. And the idea here is that, look, if you are someone like Ron DeSantis, who believes that the platforms are engaging in you know, liberal censorship of, of conservatives, that this is a way to try to rectify that imbalance and to create Sort of recognize them as sort of common carriers, but you see the difference that you know the challenge. On the one hand, Gonzalez versus Google is forcing them potentially to take down more speech. These laws in Texas and Florida are forcing them to leave more speech up, and then the Europeans are also forcing to take uh, more speech down. And so that we're in this situation where the future of the internet is really at stake, where you could end up having much more kind of uh, sort of walled gardens, even by state in the U.S., depending on uh, how the Supreme Court hold, uh, you know what they do with these cases. And my guess is that we're not gonna get a clear answer out of them, which in some ways could be the worst result because then we'll, we'll just keep litigating these, these fundamental questions. Um, let me end by just uh, 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 trying, to, I don't know if I wanna end on a, I don't know if you'll call this hopeful, but at least that there's a, there's a call to action here, right? Which is, I think a lot depends on, on what the, the truth of the, the disinformation problem, like what the dynamics really are. Um, so if I, I'm perfectly happy to be wrong about what I was saying before about what, you know, the nature of the disinformation problem, how much of it is true uh, stuff versus false stuff that is, that is causing these uh, false beliefs. Ultimately, we on the outside can only get a small glimpse of what's actually happening. 
uh, inside the platforms. And so as Jack mentioned, I wrote the earlier draft, but a lot of other people like Rebecca Trombell and Brandon Silverman have added uh, uh, some very important uh, additional sections to this Platform Accountability and Transparency Act, which was introduced um, by Democratic or Republican senators a month ago. It would require the large platforms to uh, make their data available for outside research. It would immunize uh, uh, researchers who are scraping publicly available content, and it would force on the platforms um, an obligation to make disclosures about widely viewed content, advertising, and their algorithms. Um, it was, you know, I, I released the first draft right when Francis Haugen was testifying, and so it got uh, some, some actual up tech. Uh, and, and my hope is that while I'm not so naive as to think, well, hey, you know, prioritize this over the debt limit, you know, uh, th that, but, but I think that if there is going to be tech regulation and it's possible, maybe with something with dealing with kids or something dealing with, with other parts of the online problem that we might get transparency sort of hitched on to those other legislative efforts. So uh, President Biden last week in the Wall Street Journal, you may have seen, was advocating for, you know, um, tech regulation, dealing with privacy, dealing with antitrust, uh, uh, and dealing with uh, some other issues, dealing with kids. And so if there is going to be maybe some kind of bipartisan hope for tech regulation, my hope is that this will be uh, part of that solution. But join in the fight because we need to get the data to really understand these problems. Ziad from, from Google, um, your point on not focusing on veracity, yeah. focusing on the harm makes a lot of sense and is compelling. But what we've struggled with in industry is how to define that harm. Yeah. Is it direct harm to the user? Is it more attenuated societal harm, even more attenuated reduction in trust in institutions? Because how you define it yeah. then determines what we enforce on. Yeah. And no, and, and that that I mean, we can have a long debate about this. And the answer is it's going to be some from column A and some from column B. And so clearly there, you know, there are going to be easier cases where you can see, all right, this is going to actually lead to individual harm. And then the the societal questions like election manipulation, COVID, those are, those are the harder ones, but that's the business you're in. And so let's have that debate. And, and I think that it's, um, you know, reasonable people are going to disagree about this, but that is the thing that we should be focusing on. Now, um, I, I think, I, I, you know, I think that you should be in the business of policing for some societal harms. And the question is, how can you do that in a way that's respectful of free speech? And so, uh, but, but, but what I want to emphasize, it's not going to be stopping at the false stuff either way. First, first, first of all, thank you so much for your work. And uh, I, I, full disclosure, I appreciate your your help and support yes, on a I bill. You mentioned the California <laughs> law as well. Yes. Yeah, unfortunately, it was vetoed by the governor, but we'll keep working that. Yeah. Uh, the, um, I, I guess the question I have for you is, is that, um, you know, you talked about the importance of trying to assess harm. And we heard from Google here, like, well, what? So where do you think the role of, I guess, policymakers, particularly government, right? Because very careful. Well, with First Amendment, government can't yeah. regulate speech. In terms of, you know, we don't want to ban the internet. We don't want to ban social media. But like, we have regulations on cars, and so cars can exist, but they have to have brakes and airbags and so forth. And you know, Zucker, Mark Zuckerberg said, you know, you know, to a certain extent, you know, whether you believe them or not, you know, regulate us. But I mean, that's how we come up with societal standards. So we want to find yeah. this harm. Perhaps, uh, you know, we use our de democratic institutions, uh, as skeptical as we are sometimes of them, to try to figure out, like, where are the lines? Uh, can you speak to, and then certainly uh, you touched on what's happening in Europe, can you speak to what do you think the opportunities are without, of course, crossing those constitutional yeah. boundaries uh, for uh, setting policies to help provide guidance to platforms around where you know what are the harms that they need to try to you know uh, stop. Well, th this is why I'm so big on transparency because I think transparency is a constitutional way to actually get at these problems in, a, in an indirect way. So that, for example, if you can expose how much hate speech is at, uh, users are being exposed to or, or how much disinformation, that then has knock-on effects as to how the platforms are going to behave, right? And so the the, the trend, I get a lot of uh, pushback, particularly from the left, I think, that transparency is like not a big enough hammer uh, to, to beat over tech. But actually, I think it's it's both foundational for us to regulate sensibly, but it's also in and of itself, 
it will have consequences for the way they behave. So, I mean, you've heard me sing that tune before. Beyond that, though, there are things that you could do on advertising that I think would be very important because Google and Facebook are, first and foremost, advertising companies. And they're advertising companies with search engines or um, uh, you know, social media uh, uh, corporations attached to them. And so a lot can be done on advertising as well as, you know, policing the, the you know, dealing with some of the content issues there. Um, and there are a few other things like that, dealing with privacy, dealing with antitrust, where, where we might have an impact. Okay. Nate, yeah, welcome ready. back. <laughs> I had a flash for a moment of sitting over at Moses Hall debating campaign spending reform and whether uh, reform is a good idea. So, but well, it was always said that the key to passing the American politics exam at Berkeley was just say change is bad. Uh, but, 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 uh, well, maybe we can start at that point uh, <laughs> because I wanted to ask you about in Washington, should we be looking at the Congress? Should be looking at the FCC? If you might drill down and tell us who the players are, or is that the right way to go about changing 230? Or as so many people yeah. who are in the Congress have left the barn to work yeah. for the tech companies, you could say legislation is not going to be intelligent, it'll be gutted and so forth. Looking at that, at Congress, the executive branch, the mm -hmm. agencies, what do you see? So it depends in what context we're talking about this. Look, I don't hold out a whole lot of hope that much of any uh, anything significant will be able to come out of Congress right now because of the uh, division. Uh, but you know, tech had their strange allegiances that form when it comes to tech, and so it's possible that there might be something. Something there's also possible to get really bad laws that come out of that. Um, you know, the FTC. Uh, so in the in the legislation that I talked about that I wrote, the FTC plays a very important role because the FTC has become, uh, in some ways, the main policer of the platforms because of consent decrees that it has with them. By the way, Twitter in the next, it'll be very interesting in the next few months whether they're, they're found in violation of theirs. The Cambridge Analytica consent decree, which led to a $5 billion fine against Facebook. And so as well, so on the, both the, and they police fraud. So it makes sense that they might have some role in, in internet transparency, but you haven't seen like Lena Khan for all of her, uh, all the controversy around her, her appointment. You haven't seen a whole lot of action, say in the FTC going out to the companies, um, though that maybe something is in the offing. Um, so, so I don't hold out a whole lot of hope uh, that, that Washington's going to do a lot in this area, but my hope is that, that maybe we could get something through um, that would be dealing with transparency and maybe kids. Sure. Uh, 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 and, and, now, and now in Spanish. Si quieres. I actually, in my last speech I gave it in Paris, I had ChatGPT do a speech on digital authoritarianism in French in the style of Nathaniel personally. Uh, and it was great until I had to pronounce the words, in which case I couldn't get it right. Yeah. The harm. Yeah. The harm issue. I'm a little bit mystified by the idea that policing harm is somehow easier or I didn't say that. you can get more consensus. I would think in the political realm, it's virtually impossible since the quote uh, Paul Simon lyric in one of his songs, one man's ceiling is another man's floor, right? So if yeah. you think about January 6th and you've got posts saying everybody come yeah, to yeah, the yeah. Capitol, we're going to... You know, we're going to stop the counting of the of the electoral votes. Okay, could I think most most people in this room would say that's harmful to democracy. Yeah. On the other hand, a whole bunch of other people say, "Oh, it's a 1776 moment where we're protecting democracy." So, yeah. what happens to the regulation of harm in those kinds of situations? Well, I guess you'd say it's a bridge over troubled water. Would you say? <laughs> yeah. Lie, 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 lie. Um, well, you can just, just call me out. Um, uh, so no, it's not easier to police harm. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that the point is that happens anyway. That is the business of content moderation. And the point is that we cannot pretend that the, that policing disinformation is going to get at the harm that we are attributing to the disinformation problem. And so whether it's child endangerment, hate speech, bullying, other kinds of, of problematic content, the platforms real, and, and I 
totally empathize with the, the, the challenge that you would have on, on these societal uh, problems. But the point is we shouldn't allow disinformation to be the filter through which we deal with these problems. We have to unfortunately deal with the speech itself. So thank you, Nate. And 